This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. It's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. We have a very interesting show for you today. It's about how do you predict the future. But more, more important is this. How do you get rich in the next crash? How do you get rich in the next crash? And we have one of the most prolific and most proficient and most respected economic forecasters today, a, f a friendly guest of the Rich Dad Radio Show. His name is Harry Dent. His new book is called Zero Hour, Turn the Greatest Political and Financial Upheaval in Modern History to Your Advantage. Came out in November 2017. Also, The Sale of a Lifetime, How the Great Bubble Bust of 2017 and 2019 Can Make You Rich. But also, he has a book called The Gold Bust. You know how gold is going to drop to $400 an ounce. And as I'm talking about today, as you know, I'm a gold bug, and gold, in my opinion, is making a bottom, a small bottom. So all you people who want to keep an open mind over here, because I love gold, but Harry's going to tell me why I'm full of, you know what, and also, for your real estate guys, Harry's going to talk about how real estate is about to come crashing down. So for all of you guys out there, the reason I like this stuff is because when things crash, that's when you get rich. You know, I was watching uh, Warren Buffett the other night, and somebody was asking about the crash, and he goes, he says, well, I don't worry about the crashes. I like them because that's when I get rich. So ladies and gentlemen, this is your show if you're still not rich, because what happened for Kim and I in 2007, when that market came tumbling down in real estate, that's when we made most of our money. It is the best time to get rich. So that's why I'm very happy to have Harry Dent as part of our show today. His other thing is, you know, the, when I read his stuff, he always says demography is destiny. In other words, what's going on in demographics, it's really easy to see what's going to, going to happen. So for me, it's really easy to look as a baby boomer. I look out there, and I, I think less than 50% of the baby boomers have enough money to retire on, much less if they get sick. See, what happens for most people is medical expenses wipe them out. And so as the old guys like me get older, better listen to this program here. So also, and Harry is the editor of the free newsletter, Economy and Markets, and you can get it at his website, harrydent.com. Any comments, Kim? Well, Harry is truly an economic forecaster. And, you know, nobody has the crystal ball, but he's pretty close to it. And so we got a lot to talk about today from his uh, book, Zero Hour. We're going to talk about what's, what does Harry see with the stock market? What does Harry see, as you said, Robert, with gold? What's happening with China? And where are the places to invest that he sees coming up? But also the Zero Hour is about the political upheaval and financial upheaval. And as you know, all, my friend, the Donald up yeah, there, boy, he connected. is creating a lot of upheaval <laughs> up there. So these are very exciting times. And if, if it wasn't so serious, I'd be laughing because <laughs> politics right now is nothing but one big reality show. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny. It would be funnier if it wasn't so serious and so dangerous for most of our lives. And so what I like about Harry is he's, we're going to talk about how do you turn all that upheaval and all that craziness into your advantage. Right. So welcome to the program, Harry. Oh, nice to be back. Great to have you back. So first of all, tell me when gold goes, when's gold going to go to 400 so I can load up again? <laughs> okay, okay, first of all, I have revised <laughs> that forecast when that book came out because I have a bubble model. And gold did bubble up 7.7 .7 times in several years, more than the stock market and a lot of other markets. And it did crash like every bubble, but it based out, you know, between 1,000 and, and 1,400 for a good while. And, and I think it may have one more drop. I'm just looking for the deflation play. And deflation just does not work into gold's advantage from what I see. Um, but I now see that the, the lowest I see it going is more like 700-ish. And oh. then uh, you'd have a long-term bull market. But, you know, that gold, you have to remember, like, gold goes with commodities more than anything, Robert. It's a 30-year commodity cycle. What peaked in 1980? Almost all commodities and gold and silver, and they all crashed together in the early to mid-'80s. Yeah, come stuff. on. Make, now they make me happy. Tell me it's 400. Tell me it's 400. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harry, so, Harry, do you no. see a big def deflationary period coming? Yeah, yes, I do. I mean, uh, things go in stages. You, you get 
mild inflation, you get high inflation, you get falling inflation, you get deflation. This is the Kondratiev wave that a Russian economist in, you know, discovered in the early 1900s, and it plays out over and over again. It's just like every business cycle. Innovation, a growth boom, a shakeout to see who the leaders are, leaders are and then a, then a maturity boom, then decline. So it's the same thing. So deflation is the next step. I always ask economists, especially the, the gold bugs like Peter Schiff, to say, oh, uh, hyperinflation, all this stuff's going to happen. I say, okay. Um, we printed $12 trillion on top of the normal reserves in the last, you know, nine or 10 years, and we got 0.12% inflation in most in the country. What do you think would have happened if we hadn't printed $12 trillion, which normally in any other time in history would have obviously been inflationary? And then the answer is we would have been in deflation. We started a deflation period that I predicted decade before 2008 to 2023 i call it the winter season demographics peak in a fall bubble boom and then that bubble burst and all the debt around it and then that that destroys money and debt and, and and wealth and then that causes less money swirling around and you get deflation in assets you get deflation in consumer prices and that was the economy from 1930 to 1942 that was the winter season we were going into that and how did the central bank stop that or, or put it off? Print trillions and trillions of dollars of money. And when that started wearing out, Donald Trump gives a trillion and a half of free money tax breaks to businesses when they have the highest profits in all of history compared to GDP. What's the bad news here? <laughs> <laughs> so let me well, no, ask you, this is, this is my question. Why did you choose the title of the, your latest inflation book? Inflation creates the greatest opportunity. Yeah, yeah. But you why did you bought it the bottom, huh? Why did you call the title of your book Zero Hour? What does that mean? Because we keep because we keep stimulating the economy one thing after the next. You know, one country. You know, it was the U.S. and everybody at first, and then 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 Europe tapered off again. But the U.S. stepped up, and then the U.S. tapered, and then Europe stepped up, and Japan stepped up in 2013 when they were, you know, doing a nosedive because they have the worst demographics. I was the only guy in the world that predicted in 1989 that Japan was going to fall on their ass in the 1990s while everybody else boomed. Economists were saying, oh, Japan's the new leader. Europe and U.S. are dead. I'm like, well, the demographics aren't saying that, you know, but, 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 and that's very clear. Harry, Harry, Harry. Why the title Zero Hour? Is that because because you are we at the end? Are we at the BS. end of the Contradian? Live off free uh, money and BS forever, and we're running out of that. And we're the only country left still growing decently, only because of the t Trump tax cuts, and that won't work. Past, I mean, that's going to wear off. So you're saying the end is near? Yes. Okay. And what, good, good. And what is it? I'd say within a year, I'd say now, because I, I, I what I look at, I mean, that the the top. In January 2018, looked like a perfect final bubble top. Everything I look for, rising steep channel, and then you have an overthrow over that channel, and then you break below that channel, you know, all this great stuff. And you know what? It wasn't it. It didn't happen. We didn't see a big enough crash. What I've found, because I've studied bubbles now as much as I've studied demographics and cycles and technologies and urbanization and emerging countries, all the things that matter that economists don't study, but I found that when bubbles burst, the only way you know a bubble's over when it's crashed 30 to 50 percent in the first two to three months. And that did not happen in, in January, February 2018. And it hasn't happened on the last top in, in, in September, October. So I say there's a good chance if we can not fall too much more in the, in the early part of this year, 2019, we're going to see one more bubble up, up into late 2019, early 2020, like January or so. That's good. That's and that good. actually goes with an important 90-year technology. The greatest bubbles happen every 90 years. That was the late eight, 1830s and, of course, the late 1920s and the but, Great Depressions. But aren't, aren't we at the end of that Contradio cycle also right now? Oh, oh, the Kondratiev cycle was blown out by the baby boomers. Right, right. Uh, so it, it went, it used to be 55, 60 years. I was the first guy that realized plotting the same four-stage cycle, but around now demographic booms and busts. But people don't understand that, that uh, you know, I discovered demographics and how important it is to the economy, but it, it's more of a recent thing since World War II. We didn't have middle-class um, people uh, until after World War II. 
Um, it was the assembly line and all those innovations and cars and suburbia and all the stuff that created this middle class thing where the average person's making serious money for the first time in history, not not a grubbing peasant, I hate to call it. And that made demographics much more important. Demographics always matter, but the technology cycles I study and, and, and the commodity cycles I study used to make more of a difference in the com- con- economy. Now, so, so, so if- that stretched. That stretched this four-stage cycle from 55 to 60 years on two commodity cycles to two generation cycles to 80 years. So first of all, that blew the Kondratiev wave. Same pattern. What, what, can you just say what stuff. the Kondratian wave? What exactly is the Kondratian wave? Okay. The old one was every 55 to 60 years, you would see a spring boom coming out of a depression uh, with mildly rising inflation and then – you would see a, a P, uh, an inflationary surge and a recession, and then that would blow off. Inflation would come down. You'd see a final um, bubbly boom, and it's always the most bubbly, um, fall boom. And then you, then that fall boom has the greatest debt bubbles, the greatest financial asset bubbles. And when they burst, you wash out a lot of money, and you get a depression to kind of detox. I hate to call it a better term, but a detox or deleverage that fall bubble boom. So, wait, so we've so, had the same thing. Right. So was that was that what happened in 29? That's what happened in 29. That was the peak of the fall bubble boom season in 30 to 42 was the winter season, which was characterized by deflation. And then the problem is for stockbrokers and people, even in the 70s, if you'd have been diversified, you could have made money on Japan and commodities and real estate while you lost money on bonds and stocks. Right. Well, most people in mostly bonds and stocks, you lost. But in the, in the 30s, everything went down except for high quality bonds. Everything. Wait, well, but, uh, stocks, asking, commodities, real estate. Harry, Harry, but wasn't Kondratiev executed? Did they shoot him? I don't care. They shot. They, they <laughs> threatened to burn Galileo at the same <laughs> Hey, so Harry, so what did they did. Hey, how long did Jesus, how long did Jesus teach before they nailed him? They, <laughs> they nailed him. The more they more they go after you, the more you know what you're doing. Yeah. Hey, so if zero hour is about the end, what what does the end look like? So if we're talking like a year out, what does it look like? What are people? It, it looks to like expect? Um, early early two thousand. Um, 18 looked like at first, but didn't follow through. You see a blow-off top, and then you see a very serious first crash. I mean, again, the first crash in 29 in 2.3 months was 49%. That was saying, guess what, folks? Game over. The NASDAQ crash, the first 2.6 months, 41%. I averaged out six bubbles over the last century, stock bubbles, and the average first crash was 42% in the first 2.6 months, very close to that NASDAQ crash. So did that's, you, that's did, the first sign, and we haven't seen that sign yet. So, so the end is coming. We're close. But until I see that or see a downturn that looks like that in the making, and I tracked the recent downturn, and it did not track with those past first crashes. It was telling me this looks more like a correction in late uh, 2018, and that we're going to, at some point, have one more bubble up in 2019. Uh, okay. This so, bubble is just keeps getting fed by governments, and Trump has fed it, is the last guy to feed this bubble. That's correct. That's correct. And it's wonderful stuff. So when we come back, you know, we can talk about gloom and doom, but for me, it's all good news. It's yep, all good it news. Is to me too. So when we come back, we're going to get into your other book. It's called The Sale of a Lifetime. You see, as I'll say it again, in 2007, you know, Kim and I thought we died and went to heaven because we're real estate guys, and all that subprime crash hit and all the uh, CD MBSs and all that other stuff blew up in everybody's faces. Everybody cl- cried the blues, but that's when we started to buy. So all of this bad news is really good news. And when we come back, we'll have more of Harry Dent, the economic forecaster. So we're going to get up to the good news here is how you're going to get rich when this all comes tumbling down. You're listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. Don't be like Charlie. Charlie is that do-it-yourselfer who does himself in. Do-it-yourself is good for tile and grout. It is not good for asset protection. Charlie thought he'd save a few dollars forming his LLC online. With no guidance, he did it wrong. When he sold the property, he lost thousands and thousands of dollars. He did himself in by trying to do it himself. 
Don't burn yourself. Use Corporate Direct to set up and maintain your LLCs and corporations. Corporate Direct is owned and operated by attorney and rich dad advisor, Garrett Sutton. Garrett wrote the bestsellers, Loopholes of Real Estate, and Start Your Own Corporation. He is Robert Kiyosaki's attorney for asset protection. He and his team will do it right. Visit them at CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off your formation fee. That's CorporateDirect.com. CorporateDirect.com. What is your number one expense in life? Your number one expense. It's taxes. And I've asked the question is, how come there's no financial education in school, but why isn't there education on taxes either? You know, they tell you to save money, which is stupid. They tell you to invest in the stock market, which is stupid. But what they teach you about taxes? So here we have Rich Dad Advisor, Tom Wheelwright. We're talking about his revision for his book, Tax-Free Wealth. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Robert. So what's the Tax-Free Wealth about? What, what's different this time? It's a rev revised edition. Well, so what we did was, is we ha this is the first major tax reform we've had in 30 years. 2017. Right. It was 86 was the last one. 86 was the last one right. back when I was in Washington, D.C. So many guys got wiped out because of that tax change. <laughs> they did. They yeah. did. It wiped out an entire industry, savings and loans. This new tax law is just as big, but in a very different way. It affects different industries. You know, the tax law is always a series of incentives. And the question is always which incentives and which ones apply to me. And so the, the key to revising tax-free wealth was, what is it, what changed so much in this new tax law that we can absolutely take advantage of? I mean, seriously, the amazing incentives. For example, I mean, the bonus depreciation, for example, for real estate is unbelievable. You buy a, a, a million dollar apartment, get a $300,000 reduction or more the very first year. So if you want to make more money and pay less taxes like Donald Trump and myself, get Tom's book, Tax-Free Wealth. Log on to richdadradio.com while you listen. Now back to Robert Kiyosaki. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And I guess we're talking about the eve of destruction and how do you get very rich in a crash. You see, most people think it's terrible. You know, if you're a professional investor, you think it's wonderful. Anyway, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes and Android, and all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com and we archive them because we're an education company. We don't sell and we don't sell advice or any kind of product like that. But we want you to learn and we archive it so that you can listen to this program again, especially this program with Harry Dent, economic forecaster. And you can listen to it and we listen to it a second time, you'll learn even more, but you'll learn even more and more if you have your friends, family and business associates listen to you. Harry Dent's forecast and discuss it. If you discuss it with your friends, your whole intelligence will bl go through the roof and you'll understand what Harry Dent is trying to say. And what he's trying to say is it's we're on the eve of destruction. For most people, that's bad news. For some people, it's great news. Any comments, Kim? Yeah, well, you know, we've had so many guests on and, and economic people and all saying that there's this crash coming uh, the problem is most people only know how to make money when the markets go up. And so our job is to educate and make you aware that, hey, something else is coming up. And this is what Harry's going to talk about is when the market comes down, how do you profit? How do you make money? And most people don't take the time and effort to learn how to do that. So I would say learn how to do that because it's probably coming. So, Harry, before the zero hour hits, which is your latest book, Turn the Greatest Political and Financial Upheaval in Modern History, to your advantage, which came out in November 2017, again, zero hour. Where do you see the opportunity? What's the good news here? Well, well, I, I think long term, it's still, since the markets did not crash as fast as a real top would have suggested, I think the markets may be basing, and we may see some more downside in early 2019 first. But if the downside doesn't break, especially my critical target, line in the sand for the NASDAQ, which is the leading sector of this whole bubble market, the tech stocks, is 5,500. If it can hold 5,500, it could still bubble up one more time from there. And that's exactly what happened in the last tech bubble. Late 98, there was a short couple-month crash like this, down 37% for the tech stocks. And they turned around and went up 250% in a year and a half, the greatest, you know, final blow-off rally. Now, now, they don't have that much latitude here. The, the, what happened there, the Internet stocks were part of that. 
and, and the crypto stocks and other things are not. So you won't get as extreme, but we could see one more strong bubble led by the tech stocks. And boy, so, so you play that if we don't see too much weakness ahead. And then if we get, I've got real targets for this, 9,400 to 10,000 on the NASDAQ, if we get a final bubble. If you see that, you sell and you turn around and short or just get in cash, save bonds, and wait for the big crash. So what you're saying is the FANG stocks, which is completely manipulated, what might be the next opportunity, but you got to get out at the right time. Yeah, yeah but yeah, and, and same thing. I'm, I'm speaking at a super elite crypto conference this weekend, and and same thing. If stocks bubble, I'm telling you, Bitcoin will bubble one more time, and then it will crash and burn like the internet stocks did, go down ninety <laughs> percent. I'll give you an example of of also buying in the crash. Uh, Amazon in, in a year and a half went up four thousand three hundred twenty eight percent into the top of the tech bubble. It was a late coming internet bubble stock, super bubble, crashed 95% and then went up 220 times, 37,114% between 2001 and now, one of the greatest runs in history. Imagine if you'd have bought Amazon when it was like seven bucks on its back because, hey, yeah, a lot of companies were failing, but who was the big boy on the block? Amazon. Not too hard to pick out who's likely to survive a shakeout in the internet industry back then. So, Buy Amazon, the strongest players, and, and, and you'll make a fortune. So other than Amazon and the tech stocks, what other areas are you seeing that, that could be booming? I, you know, I think the banks may do well in that final stage because they've underperformed. Uh, consumer discretionary. Consumers are like really happy right now, and they're not going to be for long because they're coincident indicators. They're, they're nobody to look to what about uh, for the future. Healthcare has done well, and, and healthcare is one of the few demographics that are still favored after the baby boom peaked in most areas around 2007. And, and we got into this difficult 2008 crash and recession. The whole reason we have all this quantitative easing is we got a patient in the emergency room, you know, that, that, that's in a coma, and we have to resuscitate, you know, have to constantly. Um, feed this patient to keep them from dying. That's, that's what the, they're just trying to keep a debt economy from dying and put off the deflation and deleveraging that would actually heal the patient and, and get rid of all the excess. So, Harry, the Harry, Harry, the Harry, 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 again. Harry, Harry, we don't care about the patient right now. I want to know about demography. What do you see happening for how the do you, How do you see the opportunities if you don't know whether the patient's going to live or not? Well, I'm, I want to find out about the demography <laughs> of the millennials. What's your forecast for them? Okay, the, the millennial boom, really, because, yes, oh, there's some millennials already spending money. Most of the millennials are still not in the workforce yet. So their spending wave, just like the baby boom, was 1983 through 2007. The millennial spending wave is 2000, the first one, because there's two of them, 2023 through 2036. So when we get there, that's by time then, this bubble will have burst. And the next generation will be driving the economy up, not as strongly as the baby boom, but still strongly enough after a major crash that, that stocks and real estate, but I'd say mainly stocks would be the most. Stocks and commodities will do very well. What about housing for the what best a, is emerging countries? What about housing That's for millennials? Are they going to be able to buy the McMansions the baby boomers are leaving behind? Uh, they won't want to at first. That's the problem. They're, they right. won't be in that stage till later. The McMansions are the worst place to be. They will want affordable starter homes. A lot of the millennials never bought because they didn't feel they could afford it or, or they've seen housing drop for the first time in their lives and the baby boomers never saw that. So they thought real estate could never go down. I've preached against that for a long time, but people never believed me until it happened. And I used to say, when people say, that can't happen, I'm like, what are you talking about? It already happened in Japan, down 67% in the 90s. So hang you know, on to your estate. McMansions for another 20 years. You might have a chance, right? No, sell them now. <laughs> well, who's going to buy them? Everybody's broke. Well, Bill, I'd rather sell it at a discount now than sell it when everything's on its back. So, and then, so as far as demography goes, what do you say for the baby boom generation? What's, gonna, what's your forecast with them? Nursing homes. Oh, good oh, news. that's good news for us. Oh, God, we're, build, we're building this huge nursing home. <laughs> yes, we are. Senior, I, I, I'm, senior go, I'm, I'm going to get the penthouse, Harry. Yes, exactly. <laughs> cruise ships and nursing, cruise ships, prescription drugs, what I call legal drugs. Baby boom, boomers have been taking illegal drugs all their life. Now they get to take a lot of legal drugs. So cruise ships, you know, pharmaceuticals, things like that, vitamins, 
and all this sort of stuff. Weight loss is going to peak pretty soon, but that's a big area now. But nursing homes is the last thing. Baby boomers don't enter. The, the spending wave for nursing homes for baby boomers doesn't start until 2019, and it'll go straight up to 2045. It'll be the biggest boom, and nobody will see it coming. Well, we see it coming, and we're very happy about the old guys, right? which is my age. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're building as long as you a, don't have to change their bedpans, okay? Yeah, well, we're, we're building a luxury time. luxury uh, senior living places. So, anyways, yeah, you, and you can to, afford robots to do that. Yeah, that, that's good news. That's good news. So, anyway, what do you think about uh, my friend Donald? How's he doing? Well, unfortunately, I hate to say it, I mean, Donald is, is a great promoter, and he knows how to read people. And when he started campaigning, I think he picked up very quickly something that the other politicians didn't. That was his genius, that the people that really have the energy and are really unhappy are white people that have lost their middle-class um, jobs to brown people here, Mexico, China, and overseas. That's a demographic and, and, shift, right? Right there. Yeah. The, 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 well, and, and that's what happened. Um, they didn't become bad workers or anything. It's just that that these skills, these middle-class assembly line jobs, by definition, by Henry Ford that created them, don't take a lot of skill. That's why he created them the way he did. So when these emerging countries come up like China or Mexico or Mexican immigrants, I don't care if the immigrants come here. I'd rather they come here because at least they're working, contributing to the economy, and paying taxes here. They can still kick your ass from Mexico or China and how is or that Indonesia. Dif- and how is that different than European, well, the refugee immigrants? Well, it's the same thing. I mean, well, they're, they've got uh, – <laughs> are, are they employing these people in McDonald's over in Europe? No, they're not. They're in refugee camps because they can't function in Germany. They can't speak the language. They don't have the skills. They're coming from super poor countries. They're coming from countries that make Mexico look rich. <laughs> so, so that's a different thing. These are not and, – and again, you could also have immigrants like Australia. I speak in Australia once or twice a year. I'm – more popular over there because they don't have so many superstars over there and uh man they it's the third asians and they're all kick ass and they're all more they're more educated and, and productive than the average australian they, their immigrants are are above them so I, I like what you said when we were talking at the break you said people coming from mexico mexico to the u.s they're coming for opportunity where the yes. refugees are escaping yeah. a bad situation they're escaping a bad that they're forced to do there they're destitute the Mexicans are coming because they want a better life. And even with no education, you know what? Most of them rise. They got caught. Donald's wrong about this. He's just pandering to his all-star wrestling fan crowd. I hate to say it. <laughs> he picked up. These are the people. And my father was a political strategist that literally got Nixon elected with a similar strategy. All-star wrestling fans, they're the swing vote. And he got Nixon to carry the South against Wallace. Okay. By, by by getting you know doing that, so that was genius. But but it, he's wrong. These people are not criminals, and they do contribute. But it doesn't mean you should let them in illegally. Yeah, so what, what's and what, what is your forecast for Asia? You know, we have, you have this in China. You have China. You have Japan, and you have uh, Korea, and all this. What's going on there? What do you what do you see the forecast well, first of for all, that? Japan was 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 the star of this whole bubble they 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 peaked in 89 their real estate peaked in 91 they crashed and had their bubble first and everybody acted like oh that's just the japanese no this has happened everywhere their baby boom hit them earliest and then everybody else later so they were they show what happens when bubbles burst japan has actually been in a reprieve people say oh it's abe's arrows oh bs Japan had its millennial generation come up, and they're going to peak in 2020, a year and a half from now, and then they're going to go into another deep demographic downturn. And they're already only growing at zero to one percent with stimulus three times what we put out compared to their GDP. Japan is the dying economy of the world in Southern Europe and Eastern Europe and a lot of other areas are going to follow them. The tigers, the Asian tigers, South Korea is the last to peak. They're going down after this, after 2018. Uh, Europe has slower demographics than we do, but Northern is stronger than Southern. I mean, I, I can nail demographics anywhere in the world. I can nail urbanization and rates of GDP per growth. Most of the stuff in the world is so predictable, you wonder, what the hell are economists looking at? Unbelievable. <laughs> we're we're going to be 85, 90% urban by 2120. I can say this today with high conference, and, and, and the wealth, the GDP per capita of the world is going to be two and a half times higher by then. People think the world's coming to an end because demographics are slowing in areas, but, but the third world is coming up. 
and I can, I can see very likelihood from past surges that life expectancy is going to go up again sometime in the coming decades. And that's going to change the demographic slowdown that, that otherwise would take us into zero growth by, by later in this century. But it's not going to happen because I've got other cycles that say no. So anyway, Harry, we'd love to have you back on. Like I said, you, you're the guy that opened my eyes to demography or demographics as destiny. And, you know, being a baby boomer, I'm just watching the destiny come up right now. And I like what you said about retirement homes because that's the business Kim and I are shifting into. And anyway, it's always good news if it goes up or down. So thank you for your contribution. And you can get Harry's free newsletter, Economy and Markets, at harrydent.com. So thank you, Harry. Thank you, Harry. Okay, thank you, guys. All right, take okay. care. And we come back with one of the next most popular part of our program, Ask Robert. You're listening to The Rich Dad Radio Show with Robert Kiyosaki. Don't be like Charlie. Charlie is that do-it-yourselfer who does himself in. Do-it-yourself is good for tile and grout. It is not good for asset protection. Charlie thought he'd save a few dollars forming his LLC online. With no guidance, he did it wrong. When he sold the property, he lost thousands and thousands of dollars. He did himself in by trying to do it himself. Don't burn yourself. Use Corporate Direct to set up and maintain your LLCs and corporations. Corporate Direct is owned and operated by attorney and rich dad advisor, Garrett Sutton. Garrett wrote the bestsellers, Loopholes of Real Estate and Start Your Own Corporation. He is Robert Kiyosaki's attorney for asset protection. He and his team will do it right. Visit them at CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention Rich Dad and receive $100 off your formation fee. That's CorporateDirect.com. CorporateDirect.com. Financial freedom begins with financial education. Now back to Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad Radio Show. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Once again, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio Show anytime, anywhere on iTunes and, and or Android. And all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. Again, the reason we archive them is because we're an education company. We make no recommendations on what to buy or sell. But we are an education company, which means the more you listen to something, listen to this program one more time, especially with Harry Dent, you will learn twice as much as you did the first time. Most importantly, get together with friends, family, and business associates, listen to Harry Dent one more time, and discuss it. You'll find your intelligence skyrocket. You will see and realize things you may not have realized before. So once again, I want to thank Harry Dent and his um, always interesting way of looking at life. He's a very smart man. He's a guy that opened my eyes up to demography, which is demographics, because demographics is destiny. Look at the old guys, my generation, baby boomers. The big opportunity is in old age homes and pharmaceuticals. Not illegal drugs, but legal drugs. So there's always an opportunity, and the point is, no matter if things are good or bad, there's always opportunity if you keep your eyes open. Any comments, Kim? Yes. Um, you know, there, this, this is a good show to listen to again because there was a lot of little details that Harry was throwing out there and, and important ones, things to look for, indicators, you know, such as you said, if NASDAQ goes to 9,400 to 10,000, sell short, get out, um, little things like that. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out according to some of what his predictions are. Yeah, and that's Harry's recommendation. Yeah. It's not our recommendation because yeah. we don't play the stock market. No. And and you can get Harry's free newsletter. I think it's a daily newsletter. It's called Economy and Markets, and it's harrydent.com. So uh, you can listen to his predictions and his forecasts. He's a very bright man. As you can see, nobody has the same point of view. Like, I was thinking we get Peter Schiff and Harry Dent go head to head. <laughs> Peter Schiff is... thinks gold's going to wear like 10000 oh, or Jesus. something. <laughs> and Harry's yeah. at, Harry came up from 400 to 700 now. So Yeah, I mean, Harry said gold was going to go to $400. I got excited, and Peter Schiff wanted to kill him. So anyway, <laughs> that's why we have the Rich Dad radio program. we got to keep an open mind. Everybody yep. has a different point of view. That's exactly right. So once again, you can submit your questions to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. So Melissa, what's the first question for Ask Robert? Robert. Our first question today, Robert, comes from Zach in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. How do you get passionate and emotionally vested in an idea and then not get discouraged if that idea does not work out? <laughs> you know how many times I'm always asked that question? I think that's the problem when you go to school. 
The problem with going to school is that you always have to be right and you can't make mistakes. That if you fail, you're stupid. Look, the, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, you're gonna fail, your ideas will probably not work. But this is what I've said to so many budding entrepreneurs. If you only have one idea, you're not gonna make it. Like a lot of times I failed, you gotta stand up and you gotta come up with a new idea, how to get out of the light, how do, you, how do you do something different? So the, build, the ability to think creatively and rapidly and take that risk and correct if you have to is something that is punished in school. It's called creativity. Because <laughs> in school there's only one right answer and it's the answer the teacher wants you to give to them. And so that's why I get a little discouraged at times and upset in the Rich Dad Radio program because so many of the questions are, what if I fail? What if I make a mistake? You know, a kid doesn't ask that when it, it, a kid is crawling and wants to stand up and fall down. The kid doesn't go, but what if I fall down? What if I fall down? Well, they never learn to walk. Or what if I fall off my bicycle? But they never learn to ride a bicycle. So one of the biggest problems with our academic system is they teach people that failure means you're stupid. And so many people are so terrified of making mistakes and having a new idea and trying something stupid, you know, because that's how he gets successful, right, Kim? Yeah, you gotta go out there and you gotta do something. You know, but it's kind of like when he says, when Zach says, you know, what happens if it doesn't work out? Well, my question is why, why is it not working out? So it goes back to my golf instructor. My golf instructor, I'll say to him, oh, I had a terrible round of golf the other day. And he said, well, what specifically? And I'm like, well, my putting was really good and my chipping was really good, but I, you know, I just couldn't get the ball in the fairway off the tee. And he's like, okay, so your game wasn't horrible. You just have to work on this part of it. So when he says it's not working out, is it not working out because it's just an idea that nobody wants? Is it a product nobody wants? Is it not working out because you're hitting walls like you're talking about, Robert, and you're, you're failing, but you're not learning from the mistakes and you're not growing with the mistakes? Is it not working out because somebody's telling you it's not? Why is it not working out would be my question. Well, let me give you an example. I came up with a nylon Velcro surfer wall business in the 70s and nobody bought it. It didn't, it didn't sell. So we had 100,000 wallets we shipped from Korea to New York. We were going broke so fast we couldn't stand it. So out of desperation, I had to come up with another idea. And that product was a shoe pocket for runner's shoes because running was really big during that in the 70s. So I created the shoe pocket and that shoe pocket became the number one product in sporting goods in 1978. But because the shoe pocket took off, everybody wanted to know what, ha what other products do I have? The other product I had was 100,000 nylon wallets sitting in a, fa <laughs> in a warehouse on Long Island, New York. Now, if I hadn't failed and I hadn't created another product called the Shoe Pocket, which is in, was in Playboy magazine, and number one product of the year in 78, I would have kept failing. Yeah, well, that's a great point, because you you, most people would have quit yeah. if, they didn't, if they didn't sell those wallets, they would have quit. And so I really want, I, I, make, I make a very, education is more important, but school teachers are not necessarily rich people. They're, most of them are school teachers because they're risk averse. So be very careful who you learn from. You know, my father, poor dad, he failed once. He bought himself an ice cream fran franchise and failed. He couldn't stand up again. And that's the problem with going to school. Also, the other problem with going to school is you, if you ask for help, it's called cheating. You know, I cheated my whole way through school. I was sat next to the smartest girl in class so I could get the good answers. But that's cheating in school. So please be careful about education because education is more important than before. But if you're gonna be an entrepreneur and a professional investor, you've really got to be able to understand how to think creatively, make mistakes, and come back up and go again at it. Or if you don't wanna do that, then go to school, get a job, and put your money in a 401k, buy, hold, and pray. That might be better for you. But it really breaks my heart to have so many people, but what if I fail? What if I make a mistake? Oh my God! I said, well, you should have gone to school, kid. You know, you need a better education to be an entrepreneur. Next question, Melissa. So, Robert, we have a couple of questions here on gold and silver, and we're going to kind of answer both of them here since they're somewhat related. So, first, we have Jonathan from Houston, Texas. Favorite book, Cash Flow Quadrant. It says, I've decided to purchase gold and silver, but I'm stuck on the storage aspect. 
where do you think it's best to store gold and can you trust anyone outside of our country? And then the second question comes from Ka in Singapore and it's about, you know, before starting to invest in gold and silver, what books or articles should someone read or study before they get started? Well, it's not that complicated. Gold and silver is pretty, pretty simple. simple. Because the, the beautiful thing about gold and silver, a coin, not ETS and that garbage, but gold and silver, there's no counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is like if you if you buy a bond, the risk is, is the guy gonna pay me back? Well, if you hold a gold coin, there's no counterparty. It's just, that's God's money. My book, Fake, is coming out. It's about God's money, gold and silver. But if the first thing you're gonna do is you buy gold and silver, don't tell anybody you bought it. <laughs> and buy a small amount, buy one gold yeah, coin or one silver one coin. One silver coin. And then you have to buy a safe. Sometimes you wanna buy two safes. I call it a dummy safe and a rail safe. So a dummy safe, in, in case somebody comes into your house and say, show me your safe, you show them the dummy safe. And in the dummy safe, you have fake jewelry and fake watches and fake Rolexes in there, and they help themselves. So they're happy because they got the dummy safe, but then you gotta have a real safe, which is real, where it's kept. And the reason you want a dummy safe in your house is because the reason you keep gold and silver in case there's a crisis, the, like the banking system shuts down, you need access to that gold and silver in cash. So the safe should be close, nobody should know where it is. Not, and, not a safe deposit box in a bank, because no. the banks will seize it. And then, and then when you have a lot of gold and silver, then you move overseas. So Kim and I do all of it. But we started very, very small. My first gold coin was a Kruger and I bought it in Hong Kong in 1972. I paid $50 for it. Today it's worth about $1,500. So I'd rather save gold and silver than dollars. That's what I'm trying to and say. And you know, the, the fastest way to learn, and this is what Robert and I do, is we go out and we go buy something. So go buy a silver coin. What's it gonna cost? About 16, 17 US dollars today. 20 bucks. 20 bucks. So well, go out buy and a, buy you it. You buy a silver dime for two bucks. Right, but to. as soon as you put some money down, all of a sudden you're go your education's gonna go up because you're gonna start seeing articles and you're gonna start seeing online, what's the price of gold? What's the price of silver? What's it doing? Why is it doing? Put some money down, even $20. It'll, it'll increase your learning tremendously. And you might make a mistake and learn even more. Yeah. Even so once better. again, I want to thank you all for, um, I'm supposed to thank Harry Dent. You can go to his website, harrydent.com. It's a free newsletter, Economy and Markets. You'll learn a lot listening to him. Not that I agree with him, but you can learn a lot. And if there's a crash, it's wonderful stuff. And then also, uh, you can submit your questions to ask Robert at richdadradio.com. So thank you for listening to our program. Yeah.